how do I make a stronger, more connected community? And uh, some people can say that, but uh, uh, you know, can you really execute on creating that? Uh, this environment where people are helping people, people are uh, like-minded and not necessarily alienating each other. You know, how do you make a community of producers potentially um, to, to build stuff together? Um, so the, those are kind of some uh, challenges that are going on in my head. And how do I make a platform that helps people more autom uh, in an automated fashion facilitate the human connection? On this week's episode of Establish Your Empire, I host Matt Winters. Matt is the CEO of Austin Visuals, which is a 3D animation studio and founder of My Network Builder. In this episode, we talk about how Matt started his career by convincing NASA to take a chance on an artist rather than the usual engineer, about how to create a community both offline and online, and his journey from working in the corporate world to becoming a freelancer and then building a rapidly growing company. You're listening to the Establishing Your Empire show, a podcast that inspires entrepreneurs, creatives, and future business owners to pursue their passions, grow their organizations, and build their empire. My name is Darren Herman, and creatively, I'm best known for my photography. But business-wise, my claim to fame is growing a company from 15K per month in online sales to breaking the $1 million a month barrier. And I'm sitting down with interesting people to talk about their process, the lessons they've learned, and how they have established their empires. All right, Matt, thank you so much for coming to be on the podcast here today. So let's go ahead and start with a little bit of background. So what I've read is that you started your career at NASA. Is that correct? And how did that happen? Uh, let's see. So I was uh, going to school and I saw a flyer saying work for NASA. So then um, I responded. It was about 400 applicants. Um, and... Uh, do you want the short story or the, I, I want or, the long, I don't really want to dive in how somebody okay. gets a, a job internship, whatever it is at NASA. So it was about 400 applicants. There wasn't much on the flyer, not, not a lot of detail, just said work for NASA, do good stuff, you know, um, and, uh, you know, work with, uh, satellite data, something like that. The next thing that happened is I, I show up in a big room. There's like, you know, several hundred people there and they show us an intro video. Uh, that didn't really, that it sort of in, introduced the program um, and it was called NASA Develop. Uh, they usually take a uh, one community-based project that the city or the surrounding community is grappling with and NASA, you know, takes it on and, and solves the problem. Um, and they usually use engineers for it, but uh, in their flyer, they didn't say anything about a requirement. So then after their long pitch and everybody's there, they say, okay, everyone raise your hand if you're uh, not an engineer. And I thought it was a weird setup question, so I didn't raise my hand because I didn't know any more details of what they were getting at. So I didn't raise my hand, and then everyone else that raised their hand, which was a majority of the people, it must have been like, you know, a couple, like two or three hundred people. Uh, they said, okay, if you're not an engineer, we, uh, we thanks for coming and uh, so long. And so then... <laughs> So then all these people left and I was, you know, still here waiting to, to see what is this even about? Didn't, didn't tell me any more details. So then they end up revealing throughout the course of the day um, that this project that they were working on, they were going to wind up selecting four people, um, all engineers, uh, and I was not an engineer. Um, they were going to select four people to work on this uh, two year long project where um, uh, so I was going to school in Savannah, Georgia, uh, this uh, island off the coast of Savannah called Tybee Island, it's a historic island, uh, was eroding and uh, A&M was contracted by the city of Savannah, Georgia to uh, grab sand from uh, however they could grab it um, and uh, put it back on Tybee Island to rebuild this eroding island. So um, over 10 years, it becomes more costly because they're digging in the same place. Now you think intuitively, why would they dig in the same place? Well, if they start uh, digging other places, they can affect the ecology, baby ducks get displaced or killed or something. So um, it's not up to A&M to determine where they need to dig next. So they just dig in the same place 
and their cost keeps going up and they wind up just charging the city more and more money. So the city eventually complains and says, we still need this, but we need another solution. And the other solution is dig in another spot, but uh, they have too much uh, conflict on where to dig. So then that takes a potential independent outside party to say, okay, we did a survey. We determined this is the best place that doesn't affect the baby ducks and the fish and everything else. Um, so they wanted to hire some engineers to uh, determine where that place was. Um, we get to the, you know, the whole presentation, the, we get down to tests and I'm down to like maybe one out of, we're down to like 40 people at this point out of the original 400. And how were they like, how were people getting dismissed? Was it just a set of questions? Yeah. And- yep. Yeah. Just d- didn't test well or didn't, didn't pay attention or something. So then, um, <clears throat> we got down to the 40 people and then they said, okay, now we're just doing one-on-one interviews with the team that has done it before for years past and hired and, and managed the whole uh, division. So then we get down to like eight, eight interviewers um, and I get in line and, uh, and I, I tell them up front, I said, hey, just letting you know, I'm not an engineer. Um, I know you called everyone out that you know was, I'm not an engineer. But based on everything that I've seen um, of that whole presentation all day, they're basically in that program taking uh, four engineers and all of this data that they gather um, winds up being presented to the city um, and uh, and A&M and it becomes a proposal and it's a pitch situation. And these pitches looked awful, like just right. completely awful. And so I told them that, uh, oh, I could do, I could do better. Why, why spend two years training an engineer to be an artist? If at the end it, it, you know, mattered about what the visual was that when they can, um, you know, just hire an artist outright and, and their presentation material will look much better and probably be more effective. Well, you're looking at 3d land, right? You're like, you're, you got these 3d spaces you have, it's a real environment. It's like, why wouldn't you want somebody who could paint that picture visually to somebody right Mm -hmm. as opposed to numbers are great to tell a story but it doesn't drive emotion in somebody's head right yeah so at at that time it made sense for them to hire some engineers but all engineers um it it uh added up to me that uh the the visual quality that i was seeing was a result of them taking engineers and and trying to get them to make a pretty, pretty presentation. So why not take somebody that's trained in that and at least add one to the team? So I pitched that to all eight of them. And then they said, well, uh, that's a good argument, but we've never hired in the six years that we've had this specific program. We've never hired an artist to do any of this. And I said, and it shows because <laughs> the, you know, the quality is, is very poor. And I said, if this really matters to you, you could take a chance and, and really elevate the, uh, the communication piece that you're trying to produce, maybe it, it becomes more persuasive. Um, I said, just take a chance. And then they did. And so I was like the first artist hired in their program. Um, and then, yeah, we, I ended up having to learn how to program um, to grab satellite data um, uh, from different NASA satellites, which is actually free to access. Didn't know that. Um, uh, like a, a lot of the most or all of the images gathered from uh, NASA are on NASA.gov and you can grab and search and, you know, royalty free or whatever. Um, and so then, you know, I'd pull down the data and then program um, an animation uh, that would visualize the the sand flowing and all the different clouds, you know, contributing to, to different um, patterns of, of water moving around the place so that um, we determine scientifically what would the best, um, you know, most cost effective area to to go ahead and and have A&M dig. And when you talk about your artist renderings, like how was that extremely specific as in, was it general or was it basically this is exactly how this coastline is? Because my assumption is you probably are, you could do some CAD work, right? And know, you know, and take a map and actually put it in there. Mm-hmm. And then so that way it wasn't just a 
artist rendition, it was actuals, but visually done. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. So, um, we, uh, so myself and a couple of the engineers would grab actual satellite data in real time and, and then overlay those visuals with some markers and, and such. So, so yeah, it was actually the real visual as satellite data sees it. Um, but there's different satellites that like, there's one for just clouds. There's one for just water. There's one for just uh, land topography. Um, and you, you can overlay, uh, mix and match, uh, uh, different satellite data to create different visuals. That's very cool. And then, so what did they think? So they took a chance on you, mm-hmm. but then was there, I mean, so do you think that's something they continue done afterwards? Like what, how do you think that turned out for, for NASA and for you, I guess? Uh, so the, the results were they wound up, um, I think saving something like 7 million out of, out of our work. Um, and, uh, they, they landed the deal. Um, beyond that, I wasn't involved with the, with the pitches. Um, I can just say for my own Testament that the, the quality level was, you know, um, significant, like two or three times better quality, uh, than anything that I've seen them produce, um, in that division. Um, so yeah. that's great. So you were talking about being an artist. I think there's so many different variations of an artist. Maybe give us a little background about your expertise there uh, of what being an artist means to you. Sure. So um, I originally went to Baylor for computer science and Waco. And then um, there wasn't exactly this um, visual feedback whenever I started getting in my upper classes. And I was expecting to to get more hands-on or some some kind of like a video game. I was expecting to get, see a character move or something that I could program. And then, uh, when that didn't happen, uh, or didn't happen to, uh, an entertaining degree, I started, um, uh, questioning whether I was ever going to get to that, to that point. Um, and I didn't know anything more about my classes in the future. So I started asking around at that time, saw Toy Story and, uh, you know, years ago, when Toy Story first came out, it was the only thing that looked like uh, it looked unlike anything else at the time. Um, so I started asking around, how is this made? And I wasn't very good at, with Google at the time. And, uh, and it took me um, about a year to find out that it had something to do with art. And then another year to find out what art to do and how to get in. And so it wound up being that I needed to, uh, even though I didn't have a background in uh, drawing or producing art, like I hadn't been doing it in high school and all those other uh, times, <clears throat> I wound up teaching myself enough art to get into art school, uh, produced uh, something like 10, 10 life-size drawings, like six feet by five feet, something like that in different mediums, charcoal and oil and uh, acrylic and all these different uh, you know methods. And then took a chance, went to Savannah College of Art and Design, um, and then they said I should do uh, visual effects based on my interests, um, which is 3D special effects. Um, and it's more of a technical track for art. So it's uh, drawing plus knowing how to troubleshoot computers and how to code some software and how to make um, elements like fire, wind, smoke happen on the screen. Um, but then you learn other things like how to manage green screen effects and, uh, how films are made and how, uh, you can, you can, there's many, I think there's probably at least 12 major, uh, verticals within th- being a 3d digital artist. And so, so if somebody, you know, you kind of hit on a couple points there that I think is interesting. I think there's a lot of people that get stuck into a college track, not sure where they're going. I was the same way. I ended up switching uh, halfway through. But so what advice would you give somebody that was in that area and then wanted to do go into get accepted into a, a art school? So like, how did you get accepted? Like you're a computer science major, art school. That to me is left and right. Like, uh, so maybe some give some advice of how you got accepted or what some, somebody could do. Sure. Um, so in my path is a little unique in that, uh, didn't, didn't know what I wanted to do. Didn't know what options are available. Um, my first suggestion is if you have the resource, if you, 
um, have friends and friends of friends that are already in interesting fields, try to job shadow with them um, as early as possible, you know, even if you're nine years old or something. Um, the, the earlier you can um, get exposed to many things, you can uh, ideally figure out which things you like to do a little more or are more interested in. Um, there, there, it, um, there is this kind of um, overlap of skill that needs to uh, be evolved to, um, to have your career take, take flight, I guess. Um, you don't not only just need to be interested in something, but you need to be able to sustain that interest. And then you need to be better than, you know, other people in that field. So um, that becomes kind of a search. So the more stuff you can be exposed to, you can find what, what's interesting and then actually take on, uh, try to solve real problems as early as possible in that thing that you're interested in. And then you'll find out whether you're any good at it or not. And other people will also tell you whether you're good at it or you have some potential. And, and then you just keep going down that vertical and then that can be your career path. I completely agree. So with the photo video, which is more my background, you know, I always tell people just, just go out there and shoot a thousand photos a month. So you're going to learn a lot. And then after you do that, shoot a thousand photos a week and then you're going to learn a lot. And you're going to realize whether you still actually still like this, whether you're good, uh, whether you should continue down the path. And a lot of times that can help where you don't have to go to school for three, four years to figure out whether you're any good or whether you're going to enjoy this career for a long period of time. All right. So I'm guessing you went to um, art school before NASA. Is that correct? Timeline wise. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so maybe walk me through uh, the rest of your kind of background, right? Cause you got a whole list of different things you're involved in now, but maybe give me more of, um, so you went to NASA, then what happened, right? Uh, so after NASA, so that was, you know, after graduated uh, Savannah College of Art and Design, uh, did NASA uh, while I was also in school and then continued uh, with NASA until after the graduation. Then um, there is an annual visual effects conference, which I highly recommend. It's very interesting. Um, usually happens around the California area once a year called SIGGRAPH. And um, I had had some professors at SCAD say, hey, you have to go to SIGGRAPH. I got my first job there. It's like magic. And um, uh, not everybody was giving me very specifics, but people were, enough people said I need to go. So then I, I went. Um, and what happened was um, a friend of a friend was also at SIGGRAPH, who I grew up in Houston. And this friend of a friend um, had... Um, a position at an architecture firm in Houston. So then they heard that I was there and my main friend, my close friend kind of paired us up while, you know, his friends were also at SIGGRAPH. And, um, I noticed that there was, it was, um, during the day at this convention, which is uh, SIGGRAPH being a visual effects conference, you can see how, you know, the latest movies are made like, like really in depth all the computers that they used and they'll do breakdowns and it's just like behind the scenes across all softwares, all visual effects, all film. Um, it's like super technical, but very interesting. And it also attracts all the big industry people that make decisions there. Um, and is this just like a trade show basically? Yeah, but it's, it's, so it's like a, it's a very organized trade show with like high level people but you could just buy a ticket to go i imagine yeah, anybody right. could right anybody very could. cool very yeah. cool yeah so so you, you went to the seagraph is what yeah. it's called yeah so you went there and then what happened um so then i uh, got offered a ticket at the at a particular booth and it was to a software party didn't know much about the software i show up and then my friend the friend of a friend wanted to get into that same party and they, they couldn't, they were, uh, stuck at the door. Bouncer said, you can't, can't come in. You only need a ticket. And they could only have gotten that ticket when I got one, which was at noon that day. So, um, I'm texting and they're, they're stuck at the door. They're the ones at the architecture firm. And, uh, I, I noticed that everybody, um, they weren't giving out stamps to return back into the, uh, venue or the party. They were giving out t-shirts. And so I went into the closet and uh, I found a couple of extra t-shirts that they had just a whole stack of t-shirts. 
I threw some over the balcony to these architecture guys and they were able to get in to a party they couldn't normally get into. They thought that was so cool that they offered me my, you know, a job <laughs> at the architecture firm. That's funny. Uh, so, well, you did hack the system, I suppose. Um, okay, so lead me up to, all right, so you got a job, everything's going well, getting an actual real paycheck. And then how did you start doing your own thing from having a corporate job to um, entrepreneurship? So um, I had a couple of jobs in architecture, and um, this was the 2007, 2008 2009 era and, uh, the economy was going, going not, not well. And, um, what was happening in architecture specifically was there was a lot of money placed in Dubai. Um, and then, uh, as part of the, uh, you know, kind of global recession that happened, um, a lot of money pulled out of Dubai and, uh, something, sometimes some architecture firms lost their budget by 50%. Um, which was just like, what do you do? So then there was massive, massive layoffs and extreme, extreme optimization. And so, um, uh, the, those people, there were people that lost their job and there were people that kept their job, but wish they had lost their job and the people that got kept, which I, I was on the, I got kept. Um, they started outsourcing, um, extremely to, you know, all different, um, places. And basically, if you were an American and had your job, you had to compete. Uh, you had to be equal in pay uh, to pe to four people they could outsource to overseas, um, meaning you had to work four times as hard to keep your job that you were previously, you know, getting just a regular paycheck. So they generally didn't decrease the salary um, very much, but uh, they would overwork you. Um, to the point where my supervisor went in the hospital, uh, their supervisor went in the hospital, and then I went in the hospital. Um, and they're, you know, calling people after they just had a heart attack because they were too stressed out on the work uh, schedule um, and saying, hey, uh, I know you had to have a heart attack, but, uh, you know, wh when's that thing going to be done? Oh, my. Um, so <clears throat> seeing that, you know, actually happen in, in the architecture community, I um, kind of got a... Um, got a wake up call and, and I didn't want to be, uh, stuck in a machine where you could literally die and, and then somebody else just checks a box and says, okay, our numbers are good today. And, you know, these are real human beings lives. And, and that in, in my experience, that, uh, situation was not a factor. Nobody came in and said, Hey, look, you know, this is going on. No, no one leveled with me. Someone just checked a box and increased my workload without, you know, having a discussion. And, um, and so since I wasn't involved in that process or felt, uh, that I had any major control of that, um, I wanted to eventually create my own system where that is, you know, less or, or zero of a factor. Um, yeah. That's, you almost only hear that about that same thing in manufacturing, low level, low skilled jobs. You hardly ever hear it, hear it in a white collar architectural firm. Um, but man, yeah, that's, that sounds like an intense process. And there's, I think there is also something to be said about controlling your destiny, you know, own your own company. And granted, there's a lot of other difficulties. It's changed, but you do get control where you're going to go, not somebody else telling you. So, all right, so you're having a tough time. This is not fun. What do you do? How do you do it? Um, so uh, eventually after I got, um, after the uh, medical stuff, I, and I got on my own two feet again. Um, I, um, <clears throat> was looking for, to, to change out of architecture because I, I felt if I went, you know, for a third job in that area, just get in the same, same stuff. So, um, I started looking on Craigslist at the time and I found, uh, a place in Austin or near Austin, uh, that was hiring for, um, it was hiring for free. Um, it was, uh, they were working on an animated short film for kids and, uh, it was, you know, 3d animated film pilot for ABC to, to pitch or something. So, um, I was number three hire for, um, several months. I didn't get paid anything. I ended up taking on this spec work, um, to be able to get out of my, um, 
I guess in in an actor sense, uh, their actors can get typecast if they just do action films, then they're doomed to do more action films or right. comedy, more comedy. So similarly, if you have an architecture portfolio, then you have to do more architecture. Um, and it does almost doesn't make sense because you're like, I can do 3D, I can do this and that. But then they'll they'll say, well, can you do it for on 4K for film? Can you do these characters in this special way? You know, yes, you can do it in this one aspect, but you need other techniques to successfully uh, finish the pipeline out and, and, and another vertical. So you kind of have to start from scratch. You start building a brand new portfolio, even though you're a professional now. Um, so I applied to this Craigslist thing. I worked for free to build up my portfolio for with this uh, short film and um, uh, got in charge of building out the render farm, which is the, the render farm is a series of computers you, you string together so that the um, final quality of a, a 3D program can achieve, you know, extra levels of, of visual niceness. You know? And did you do that here in the U.S. or was that overseas? The, no, the it was farm? here. Yeah, it was here. And the way I always think of rendering a lot of times, because a lot of people might not know what that means, is basically you're baking it, right? It's like a, in a very simple form and then you have all these layers that are on top of it or however you want to say lighting and colors and kind of the finishing touch touches and then it has to go bake in that farm which could take days upon days hours upon hours whatever it might be it's very common and also the, the video world right but way less intense than mm -hmm. the uh animation world so and then how did that film do um so then they they finished it out it wound up taking 25 artists and it cost like a half million dollars to, to produce. Um, and then they ended up starting out with originally it was a three minute um, teaser. And then it ended up being like 14 or 15 minutes. Um, they started out with three characters or four characters and ended up with like 21 characters. Um, so another lesson is, for other productions of that scale is, you know, you, before you start hiring artists and, and producing it, you want to have the locked in script. The script was evolving while they were having artists, you know, make it, which made it more complicated to manage. Um, and it ended up taking about two years roughly to produce. Uh, but all these artists had never produced a film before. Um, and so, uh, so that, that was a, a accomplishment in itself. So then um, it became a pitch for ABC, they pitched it, uh, didn't go anywhere. That I mean, they they got some meetings or something. Um, they won some awards at festivals, and then that that was it. And so then they just fired all the contract artists. Um, so and, and it, um, I think after about three or four months of working for free, then they offered to pay us. And and at that time, they were paying us like three hundred a month. I think. Oh wow. So how were you living then? Did you have some savings? Uh, yeah. So I, I, I had basically savings and then I, I moved in with my um, aunt and uncle who lived nearby. And so then that, that's basically how I was scrimping by um, for, for that little, little money. And it was basically gas money and food money uh, to get to work. And, and then they were also offering people to live on site. Uh, in trailers that, you know, that was part of the exchange. If you worked a little extra, you could get your own trailer to just live here. Um, but uh, you're still getting paid 300 a month. That's full, full startup culture there, but it was on for a film instead of a uh, product, I guess. Yeah. So, the, and then, and then what happened? Like, so, you know, you're here in Austin now, so at least you're there and you're working on these films, you're getting a different portfolio, you're growing, growing all that. How do we turn this into a company, right? And I don't know if I'm jumping too far ahead either. Sure. So, so um, all that, basically, I'd seen enough um, uh, from the full production about how to make uh, custom you know, music and characters and concepts to, to finish. And um, so then <clears throat> I discovered that if I could go, go on Google Maps um, as a, say, freelance contractor on the side, um, I started getting phone calls and then that's sort of what started my own thing. Um, at least, at least as far as the, the mechanics go, I started on Google maps 
made a made a brand presence for myself and then i started getting phone calls and when you say and, google maps did you just create like a profile that yeah. people so that we, people would search in the area and and your name would pop up yeah um and so then you're starting to get freelance gig, gigs mm -hmm. and what happens to a lot of people is they they start getting a couple you know projects here and there they get a little, little revenue and then they stay a freelancer so maybe walk me through or, or provide some value there of how you change it from a freelancer to a company like and how what steps you took um so i think in in today's uh era the um concept i guess of you know from freelancer to company um there's a, a little bit of blurry lines um because the the method of operation can still be highly profitable um, in what's known as a traditional company sense. So generally speaking, you think of a company, uh, private or public, if it's public, then it has stock and shareholders and, and all that. If, you know, private, then it's one person owned. Generally think of it as a brick and mortar establishment in both cases. And you, you imagine, um, you know, a nine to five, there's 10 or 15 people in desk turning away on computers. Um, in the digital, especially in the animation area era, um, uh, in 2011, um, I had already been used to kind of working somewhat remote anyway. Um, so then I started, you know, creating more remote pipelines where I'd, you know, call up some contractor, um, uh, somewhere else in the city or somewhere else in another city. And, and then we'd work together, but separately. Um, so I think that that, that concept of, you know, going from freelancer to having multiple people to having lots of people, at what point do we call it that a company? I'm, I'm not completely sure. There's probably some technical definition. Um, but to, to answer your question, um, I started off as, as an independent and then I, uh, I was getting a couple of deals. And then there was one guy that ended up giving me a very big deal. Um, and, um, and that it, it was more money than I had, you know, experienced in my lifetime at one time. And then that, um, gave me the idea that, you know, there's possibly more money than that if I keep going on the path. And how did you get that deal? Like, did it just happen it organically? Google Maps. It yeah. just or somebody reached out. Somebody cold. reached out and they had called everywhere in, in Austin and they had, um, uh, they wanted to wine and dine certain clients, um, and produce a stereoscopic, uh, experience. So that's the one where you put on 3d glasses and stuff pops out at you on the screen. Um, <clears throat> now you can pop in avatar or pop in something that's pre-made and put glasses on. But when you talk about, creating a custom experience for a small audience that's completely in 3d and that you use 3d glasses on that is a special. So it's a specialized requires lots of specialists um, in order to produce custom content. That's also good with marketing and produces a message and looks cool and all these things. Um, and um, yeah, he was on a budget never everyone is. So uh, the challenge became how do you produce this like, you know, Michael Jackson level, you know, IMAX thing for someone's uh, intimate audience um, on a budget. And I figured it out. I, I did enough phone calls to uh, fuse a pipeline together and solved his problem. Um, and so you, you were basically the only person that could do it for what he at, had. Yeah, it's at the time because he had called all over Austin and everybody had either turned him down or called him crazy. And, uh, and he, and he's like, I want to do it in Austin, but nobody will take me on. So then I, I heard his idea and I didn't have the capabilities at the time. And I just told him, so I said, I don't have those capabilities. Um, and he said, please, will you just, you know, uh, take two days and think about it. And he's like, and call me back. So I said, okay. So then I thought about it and then I gave a couple of other people a call that I did know were experts in some of that. And then I introduced them together and we made a pipeline like that to get it done and got it done. That's awesome. So then after you had, you took on this test, it sounds like it turned out well 
for your client and for your experience. And then did it just kind of keep happening organically? Did you do just marketing? Like uh, how, how did the, how did your business grow? Um, so yeah. So heavy, heavy marketing. Um, uh, the, it, from Google maps, it wasn't like, you know, oh, we did this deal. So, um, they referred us more business. Um, you know, th these are kind of more one-off sensational ideas. And then once you produce it, then maybe they have another idea like next year or something. So, um, I, at the time, uh, my grandparents had passed and they left me, um, a sizable amount of money. Um, and I had seen a lot of my other family members, um, just overtly squander this money. Um, like for instance, uh, the, one of my uh, relatives, uh, was the first to get paid and they took all that cash and they bought all this diamond hunting equipment, um, and took their boyfriend, um, to Arkansas, went hunting for diamonds, came back, no diamonds, no boyfriend, and, uh, had spent all the money in a month. Wow. Um, <laughs> and, um, you don't think that's good use of the resources? Uh, well, it was, it was an interesting take. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and then, um, so I was the fourth in line to receive, um, you know, a payout. And, uh, and then I saw, you know, other relatives not do something that extreme, but basically blow through their money very quickly. And, uh, and, and they were kind of in a position where they sort of needed it. And, but the, it, they wound up, paying off some bills, but didn't pay off all of them. And then ended up getting just, just blowing it, you know, gambling or, or wherever. Yeah. Um, so then I, it came for my time and I said, okay, well, I don't want to end up like them, uh, that those are bad examples. So let me try to invest in, you know, what I see is, as I'll put some money in, in hopes that I get more than what I put in out of it at eventually. And, um, and yeah, it, it it did, did work out. Um, but yeah, I wound up taking the money and I hired an assistant and that assistant knew, uh, a local marketer. Um, cause I did, I knew nothing about marketing zero at the time, uh, or practically zero. Um, I hired this marketer and then he, uh, ended up working with me to take my poor, um, student independent contractor ideas and, you know, kind of turn it into more of a business and taught me a little bit about branding. Um, and then the rest, I, you know, just sort of learned by doing. So I would, you know, uh, watch, watch what he would do marketing wise. I'd try a little bit in a different vertical, you know, if he was doing, trying to find architecture leads, then I would try to find engineering leads. Um, and then I learned enough to be able to, to do it myself. And then for the marketing, just uh, some approaches there. Did you, were you, to get these leads, were you scouring the internet? Were you cold calling? Were you uh, doing SEO? Were you, you know, doing ads? Like what, what, what was working for you? Um, yeah, so we're try, trying everything. Uh, what wound up working for us, um, at, you know, in those days was eventually organic SEO. Um, just showing up page one on Google. And then... Um, uh, also just making blogs and posting on social media. So, uh, we still do that all today and, you know, we do a lot more than that. Um, but yeah, that was the foundation. Great. And maybe walk me through like what, um, cause we kind of jumped around a lot, kind of more of the start of your background. Like, what are you doing today? Like what's going on? What, what, what you got your hands in a lot of different areas. Maybe give us kind of an overview and, and some deep dives wherever you want to go with it. Sure. So, um, so my main, main thing is austinvisuals.com. We make, you know, marketing videos, um, uh, right now for this past year, about, about 50% of our business is explainer videos. So let's say a startup or a business of different sizes just launches a new, uh, web page or product or service they want to offer, then we'll take wherever they're at. Sometimes they don't have a full script, um, or a fully formed idea. Um, and sometimes they have an exactly an exact idea with photo reference. We'll take any stage they're at and then simplify, kind of refine their, their script and their outline, um, simplify the messaging and try to pare it down. Usually these, these ideas are start off five minutes when they pitch us the, this is what we need, you know, five or 10 minutes of a video. And we'll say, no, people's 
tension spans aren't that long. So then we'll um, pare the video down to where it's about a minute, usually. And then, um, you know, the long, long and short of it is, you know, we'll, we'll produce that video. Um, the other things that we do, uh, we sometimes make um, um, virtual reality installations. Uh, Trump had uh, visited our virtual reality installation at, at Cameron LNG um, in um, Hackberry, Louisiana. Um, so we, we produced a six to eight minute um, uh, virtual reality experience that kids could go into and, and uh, you know, experience the, the uh, Cameron um, uh, whole, the whole, uh, liquid natural gas process. They could see how everything, you know, looks and, uh, and also participate a little bit. On, in that. So it's more like an educational video, but it was interactive. It sounds yep. like. So, and you were saying uh, uh, president Trump came and visited the area mm -hmm. and how, so were you a third party to make that facility or is that your guys' facility? Um, we were a third party to make, um, one part of an installation that was a, an on-site museum um, for, for Cameron. It's very cool. And when we met, you briefly talked about you were also doing some, um, sound like virtual reality for um, training videos or something like that. Can you explain that a little bit? I th thought that sounded interesting. Um, yeah, so the, on the virtual reality, you know, I guess training side, uh, we do provide, provide those. Um, uh, the uh, initially I got, we got into them just because somebody uh, out of our explainer videos, somebody said, Hey, could you do that also? Um, and then that's, you know, after you produce a body of work, you can, you know, go after more business like that. Um, and, uh, there is a really strong use case for virtual reality in reducing, um, workplace accidents in, especially in industrial and technical manufacturing types of instances. And walk me through that. How did that actually happen? Like, how would you lower some of the common issues? I have some thoughts, but maybe it'd be better if you uh, you, know, you explain it, right? Sure. Um, yeah. So, the, typically speaking, we would uh, if if we got got a call for that, um, we would probably because these are technical, you know, issues. After just some initial questioning, we'd probably go down there and visit the site, um, you know, on site. Um, find out from different points of view, different engineers, like what's going on, try to uh, cross-reference that with um, incident reports. Um, we're not a forensics uh, team or anything, but um, having more data can basically um, allow you to, to prescribe the right solution. So um, typically a lot of these um, uh, industrial uh, facilities are experiencing uh, places where the, a lot of slip and fall accidents, a lot of uh, putting a battery in um, backwards and it causing a fire, uh, pu pulling the wrong lever or pushing the wrong button and it causing an explosion. Um, and uh, some people do it, you know, because they um, just were drunk or they were uh, not paying attention or dehydrated. Um, for, for whatever re the reason, there still is um, these chronic accidents that happen. And when they happen, they usually cause lives or severe in in injuries. Um, and so uh, with the, typically right now, there's a lot of these kinds of places that have video training already in place. Um, but virtual reality uh, adds an additional layer that video does not provide, which is when you see a video, um, you can see that, let's say the, um, you're installing a battery on a forklift and you need to do it in a very specific way and very specific timing. You can watch the video, um, and, <clears throat> but a couple of things that happen, you don't get the muscle memory, um, from actually performing the action. Um, and then if you perform the action wrong on the video, it'll just have like a big X. Don't do that. Um, which on the surface has an impact, but, uh, in reality, it's not as effective. Um, and so in the, uh, fail case, uh, of in virtual reality, you put in the battery backwards on a forklift, um, it will actually explode around you or, or there'll be a small explosion in diff different places. And now you have to train for where's the fire extinguisher. 
Where's the you know phone to call? Who do who do you call? How do you dial? Um, those things that don't really happen in video training, um, you get the muscle memory for, and also the learning experience. Yeah, it's it, you make it more real without somebody in a safe environment without somebody getting hurt. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, that's very interesting. Uh, I, I think that there's just so many places that can go right in training, I think is a great spot where I never really thought about that with virtual reality, but it makes so much sense. Cause right now I don't think just virtual reality is really there yet. It's not in everybody's homes. Not that many people are going home and playing for eight hours. There is some, but it's a niche. Um, and I think in the industrial marketplace, I mean, I could definitely see some training to where not only would, um, reduce some accidents, but you could probably speed up the time to, to train an employee on some tasks that have some, you know, maybe a little advanced motions or whatever. Um, and then you also have, um, this, uh, my network builder or is, is, is that was, that's what it is. Correct. Uh, my network builder. Um, so what give you the idea to do stuff like this? What, like walk us through that. Sure. So, uh, it's my network Um, uh, years ago, let's say 20, let's see, 2011, about 2012, 2013, beginning of that, I was, um, kind of, you know, I was working very hard on the animation company needed to blow off some steam. I've always, uh, kind of enjoyed cooking and gathering people together. Um, and in Austin uh, at the time, I didn't really feel like I, I was, I was working so much. I didn't really have time to make lots of strong friends and hang out just socially. So, um, what I did was I would, uh, gather some, some of the people that I would meet here and there in my free time. And then I'd invite them over for dinner and I cook for them. Um, and eventually the, those got very popular. We'd play a board game at the, at the end, uh, share some stories kind of thing. And then eventually it grew into 150 people coming over to my place every couple of months. Um, and then, um, so some, some people, I was texting people and I was having a really high conversion, uh, for, for people going from the list to actually my event. Um, and then somebody said, Hey, you're, you're working really hard on this. Why don't you, uh, discover uh, meetup.com. So they introduced me to meetup, um, which is meetups, a social network for people that want to meet up and hang out, but you're you're a group of strangers that want to make friends and do interesting things based on uh, particular niches. So there's a meetup for uh, if you like tribalism or if you like, um, you know, if you're vegan, um, any kind of niche um, you can think of, there's generally a meetup for. And then a group of like minded people gather in a physical place. Um, you usually have one main organizer. So I, um, at the time I was developing, um, a mobile app concept. And, um, so I decided to make a, um, six different groups. I had some social groups, some, um, business groups and one, a mobile app development, almost like a mastermind group. Um, so I made all these different groups on meetup, became really good with it. Um, and eventually started growing this following on meetup. Um, which, um, I'll, I'll kind of jump to the end and then jump back. So, uh, in the end, I ended up growing such a following, uh, and got really good with, uh, networking and, and community building, making events, uh, that I saw, uh, there were cer- certain problems that I experienced as a community builder that your average person that doesn't have a hundred thousand people and, you know, it, that they can email. Um, the, 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 your average person doesn't experience, um, you know, so some, some of the challenges are, uh, for an organizer, once you get past, I don't know, 3000 people, um, uh, of your following, other people get jealous. Um, <laughs> they, they imagine what you're doing. Uh, and this is just a guess that some people imagine what you're, that, that you have more than them. And just as far as followers go, whatever you can do with them. And they're imagining all this money you're making and all these people that are your friends and, and all this, they get jealous and they try to take you down or they try to, you know, harass you or create some, some little drama or something. Um, and then also there are other organizers that have a similar, um, amount of following. So other 
uh, let's say at the 3000 person level, there are other organizers that have 3000 3, people and then they'll, they might get jealous or they might get skeptical of what are, what are you doing? Are you going to take my 3000? And, and then when you move up to the 10,000 and, you know, on up 20,000, 50,000, 100,000, there's always someone new that has just as many followers or, you know, plus or minus. And, and then you run basically butt heads potentially with, with them. Um, sometimes, uh, I, a lot of times you're not looking to butt heads with them, but, uh, it just, you know, people have a territory that they're used to you know, being the, the main person that can do all these things like a superpower. And then all of a sudden they have to share some of the space, uh, even if it's an outskirt, you know, or a couple of people overlap or something, then they get, they get threatened. So, um, those are some, some quick examples of things that I had to deal with as I grew my following and not trying to, uh, impose on other people's following. Um, and the other challenge too, as I grew was, how do I get a message across to all these people, um, but I don't double, triple, quadruple communicate to them? Because some people, uh, you know, love you and they follow you wherever you're, you're, you are. You're on Facebook, you're on LinkedIn, you're Instagram, you're on the email. Um, and how do I get it to everybody? But at the same time, if somebody is um, a member of everything that I do, they're going to get blasted with all of my, the same promotion and you can alienate them potentially because they're getting blasted 10 times, which is the best people that you don't want to alienate, right? Right. Is following you all those other places. Yeah. So eventually again, you know, jumping to the end, I tried to, um, create a a solution that I wish I had, uh, back in the days that I was growing my network. So I grew from in basically three, three and a half years, roughly. I grew from zero to a hundred thousand people of, of, uh, followers. Um, and I got an award from meetup saying I built one of the most active meetups in the world, um, in 2016. So, um, with that, with that experience, I thought, well, let me make a community building tool that helps people, you know, network faster, uh, and keep, keep your tribe close to you. Um, I was seeing lots of, um, let's say pop podcasters and, um, other business people with, with large followings that wouldn't have those emails. Um, some would have a, a, you know, an email list, uh, as a way to keep in touch, but, uh, a lot of them just had, you know, hundred thousand on YouTube and then had no other way to communicate with these people than to make a whole nother video, which is time consuming and potentially costly. Um, but having another way to communicate with these people, um, uh, is, uh, is helpful to, for business and, and also to help grow the, the community. Uh, but I, I took it a step further in that this isn't just an email list. This is an interactive tool. So it gives it introduces people to each other, the group members to each other, um, based on their individual preferences. And, and it's automated so that the main organizer doesn't have to facilitate any of that. Um, so you can still have your email list and you can still communicate with everybody, but then now they're interacting with people and they're getting, getting value from meeting other like-minded people automatically. And what's your kind of end goal with, with your, uh, with this project? Um, I, I think a l- little early to tell, uh, where it will ultimately evolve to. But um, my first primary goal is to um, uh, try to connect, uh, establish different niche audiences um, that, you know, enjoy this kind of level of connection um, and then um, uh, produce uh, very targeted events and very targeted uh, introductions based on interests. Um, Because I feel like um, or, and based on some research that I've done, um, we're, we're now in, in 2020, we're inundated with, um, you know, I, I get like seven emails from LinkedIn every day. I get, um, you know, newsletters that I didn't subscribe to. Um, I probably get anywhere between 50 to 100 communications every day. Um, and I, I would say that, maybe just throwing a number out there 
maybe 40% of that communication is unwanted um, and, and not requested. And so um, I think that everybody else, uh, at least in the U.S., is starting to go through some of that digital overload. And uh, the way to cut through the noise as a business and as a brand is to give people um, more useful, very specific content um, that is catered and targeted to, to their particular needs, which newsletters just don't do. You have 5,000 people on a newsletter, you send one message, and then, but all, you, if you got 5,000 people to, you can't get them all to agree, generally speaking, on one thing. Um, and, uh, and so when you send a newsletter out, you're, you're assuming that they will agree that this content is exactly what they want. Some will, yes. Uh, maybe it's 2%. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, um, when you segment, you know, let's say, let's say you got, even if you've got a hundred thousand users, you're probably still only doing four or five segmentations. So yep. it's not like you're doing, uh, not, it's not enough. Yep. Ever. I mean, and I've managed some large email lists for some clients, you know, even in the hundreds of thousands. And, you know, you always keep on trying to segment it down, but at the end of the day, like you only have so much time to make four different, you know, you don't want to make 50 different emails every day or every week or whatever. So yeah, it gets pretty generalized and it's not, and it's dumb, right? So your email isn't very, it's very difficult to make email to be variable based on say if somebody's you know you have 14 different pro, d- different profiles built in there mm-hmm. and where are you at in the process of the, of this like so say if somebody's just listening and has never heard of you never heard of your, your your my network builder like what stage do you think you're in right now uh could you clarify that a little bit i don't know is it very beginning middle oh. like where you just to kind of in general sure. where, where, do you, where do you feel like you're at now yeah so i think right now we're um i i'm i'm at the MVP stage, minimum viable product. Um, it works. I've got, um, you know, several thousand people on the platform right now. Um, and I'm getting, you know, uh, feedback and, you know, most of it's good and adjusting for things that are some bugs. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that it has some, um, more features to build in before I can say that it's a complete closed circuit, its own ecosystem. Um, but so far, what I've built seems to be sustain- sustaining itself. Um, uh, I'm not getting you know, booed off the stage or anything. Um, and it's uh, personally helping me grow my brand. And uh, uh, I've heard of people already not, not only getting business connections, but people are, uh, I've run into several people that have gotten dates out, off of it right. uh, because they've you know, got, it's just, um, introducing people to people. And so whatever those stories are, I haven't collected all those stories, but it's it definitely working. Um, and it's working because it's introducing niche audiences that are local to each other. Yeah. And, and then you're also throwing a bunch of events, right? So I know it's kind of similar to your, um, to the same purview of your, of your, of your program. So I went to an event, was that two weeks ago, something like that and spoke at it. And I met, I mean, everybody there was I felt like pretty like-minded people, very interesting group. Um, is that kind of what you see moving forward? There's a lot more events, so offline and online kind of uh, of environment for my network builder. Is that what you're thinking? Or uh, yes. Um, so I want to try to make, um, or the the problem that I'm trying to solve, uh, at least right now, is how do we? Uh, for now, um, Austin is my sandbox. It's my home. So um, that's why I'm focusing on, on Austin first. But um, how do I make a stronger, more connected community? And uh, some people can say that, but, uh, uh, you know, can you really execute on creating that, uh, this environment where people are helping people, people are uh, like-minded and not necessarily alienating each other? Um, you know, I, it's kind of, um, uh, you know, how do you make a community of producers potentially um, to, to build stuff together? Um, so the, those are kind of some uh, challenges that are going on in my head. And how do I make a platform that helps people more autom- uh, in an automated fashion facilitate the human connection, which I feel that um, it, it, at least in Austin, it seems like we're so busy that we just get into these 10 second elevator conversations like, Hey, how's the weather? Love that weather. 
Um, I don't want to hear about the weather anymore. I mm-hmm. want to hear about how you're doing. I want to hear about what do you, what do you like? You know, what are your interests, uh, your tastes? Um, who do you hang out with? Um, those kinds of conversations, I get into some of them, but it's not this organic, just flowing from Austin. I've been to other parts of the world. I travel a lot where it does naturally flow. Um, and, and in Austin, uh, there's, it's, uh, it feels like a work culture. Well, it's growing. And I think that's definitely the case. One of the big reasons of starting this podcast is exactly what you were just saying with, I felt like myself was getting so busy. That I stopped kind of networking, stopped getting kind of out of my shell. It's very easy to just keep working. Things were growing. I got multiple businesses. And my thought was, it's not the easiest thing. It's not that hard either, but it's not the easiest thing for me to be motivated to say, hey, let's go get coffee with somebody they don't really know. I know I could do that, but I knew that maybe I'd get motivated for a while, but I wouldn't sustain it. The podcast, I thought was, well, I can reach out to somebody. Hey, let, you know, let's go chat for an hour and a half, right? Um, and I would do that. And then setting some parameters of it has to be released every week, et cetera, et cetera. So that I'm forcing myself in this environment, which has had some uh, extra effects of going to events like yours and going to founders event, I think was after party or whatever, when, where we met and, and et cetera, et cetera. And hopefully that snowball effect happens and it just gets bigger. Mm-hmm. I think creating an environment does a lot of things for you, but it's also hopefully helps other people. I do know the other event that, that, that went to, um, that you had, um, that I've had three or four people reach out to me since that event. So oh, good. yeah. And, uh, and then one just, uh, connected me to somebody else as oh, well. Great. So to be on the podcast. So, uh, you know, so we're already starting that spider web out and we're only, you know, 10 days away from the event. So it's very mm-hmm. interesting. And my first event I've, that I've gone to of yours. Well, and, and I, uh, you know, initially really launched this October with, uh, with this whole system. Um, so to be able to, to you know, have that experience for you and be hosting these events and and getting you know I'm getting traction um, and you know it's just a, a few months into the whole process so it it seems promising. That's great. So walk me let me know like the next what's the future hold for you like five years one year wherever you want to take it like what do you see and it doesn't have to be force anything specific like where where do you see yourself? Well. Um, I guess currently uh, for, let's say, AustinVisuals.com, um, uh, we're going through a growth phase right now, which is a good thing, um, especially in a, in a recessive economy. Um, the, um, uh, our sales tactics uh, and, and strategy uh, has, has gotten better and more sophisticated. And so um, when I scale, um, I haven't figured out whether... Scaling is going to be more beneficial for everyone on my team uh, to have a physical space and, you know, buy real estate and, and go that direction if we get, you know, 100 people on the team. Uh, right now, we're about 20, um, but we're all remote. We all work from home. Um, so I don't know how that system scales at 100 people um, if and, we need. And not to cut you off, but we'll give, give me some key clients that you guys have, because I think I read on your website you had some pretty interesting clients. Yeah, we, we have AT&T as a client. Um, we have, um, uh, or, you know, we just, we just finished a project for AT&T. Um, and uh, we have, um, uh, we, we finished work for John Deere, um, the uh, Smithsonian. Uh, we've done work for the Discovery Channel. Um, so the, there Hong Kong? You did yeah, the uh, Hong city. Kong government. Uh, we, we've done some scientific work for them. That's amazing. Um, yeah. So, um, it, it's really all over where we've got a global presence. And so, um, yeah, fortune 500 companies contact us cause we show up on a Google search, but also, um, we've gotten lots of referrals, you know, the more we do for, you know, big companies then, as I mentioned before, we had, uh, have, um, Cameron the, for the oil and gas, uh, component. So, you know, we tend to lend ourselves more to the technical and the oil and gas arena, uh, and then also in medical as a vertical. So very cool. And then, and then continue kind of what's some other future, uh, what's the future look like at hold besides Austin visuals? Where, where do you see yourself? Yeah. So I think, um, um, my, my hope is through, you know, some of this networking, um, that, um, I can meet, meet a few folks that 
know some uh, complementary skill sets about you know how to go public or you know how to um, solve even more interesting challenges. So I think in you know uh, five years we'll be you know I mean may, maybe two or three times larger um, than uh, what what I'm maybe even projecting right now um, for the animation company for the uh, networking app, my network builder. Um, I think that it's going to um, facilitate enough com- communication and conversation that people want to either invest in it um, and then it can, you know, really go, go uh, well with marketing. Um, and um, may- I mean, maybe start another project, but I think these two are interesting enough that I'm just going to scale vertically and, and keep, keep on this path. That's plenty of work already. Mm-hmm. So what does success look like for you? Um, I guess, you know, just making several, several million a month, um, <laughs> you know, um, I think that plus, um, having a, um, a work culture that makes me excited to get up, uh, to work every day and, uh, um, excited to be around the people that, uh, that work for, for me. So. Any mentors or books or anything that you've had along the way that's helped you? Yeah. So, um, I've, I've taken uh, several courses, about nine courses in Landmark Education. I, I do recommend that. Um, Landmark basically just sort of, um, it's kind of like a group. Um, it's like a group examination of the barriers that you experience as, a, as an individual. Um, so if you can remove these barriers, then your performance is elevated. Um, but it's more than just uh, like a, uh, an education course. Uh, that you can sort of do yourself. You go through an experience with with Landmark um, that uh, has you think in a different way and process problems in a different way. So I I recommend that in in addition to um, you know Seven Habits of Highly Effective People and you know just um, uh, there's uh, Steve Zaffron's The Three Laws of Performance that I read uh, that I liked as well. Yeah, so we went to, uh, I have some friends, so you said Landmark, right? here. Did you go to the one here in Austin? Yeah, I went to one in Austin. So we went to, my wife and I did a kind of introduction night. Uh, I have some friends that have gone. I've had a couple other friends have talked about it. So it's something mm-hmm. that we're very interested in doing. So it sounds like a recommendation there as well. Um, yeah, I did their two, two big courses, yeah. uh, and then I did seven smaller courses. Uh, and yeah, probably about eight. Yeah, seven or eight years ago, I took my first course, and I, I would say it was life changing in in that respect. And it because of Landmark and you know a couple of other books that I was reading, I was reading um, the uh, Baylor. Um, uh, there's I'll I'll think of it in a second, sure. but um, uh, it, there's some personality tests that can uh, analyze right. you know what you're good at. Um, uh, something strengths finder yeah i haven't i haven't uh actually read that at all or heard that much so i'll have to check that one out um but see so yeah, it sounds like the landmark might be something in, uh in, in my near future i know they have another event here in may so we were looking at going because i couldn't uh, attend the one in march um what about what, what's of all the stuff you've done so far what are you most proud of proudest of um i think being able to create uh a culture at Austin visuals that, um, uh, that is friendly. We work hard. We have respect for each other. Um, that was something I could read about. Um, but really kind of had to happen organically and, and through some trial and error, you know, it required a combination of self growth, finding the right people that also believed in a similar vision, finding the right people that had, you know, good skills and good habits. Um, so all of that coming together, um, was, uh, uh, it's the most rewarding, uh, cause I know that I built it with my, you know, with my hands. And then at the same time, I didn't build it because it, it, I, I put things in place and the magic of the culture happens organically after that. There's no more, like there's no control. There's no setting the stage anymore. It's just, you know, people interacting with people. And, uh, and I, I find it rewarding that, that uh, they are so pleased with their, with their uh, work 
and and how they're interacting, um, that it's it's a it's a positive cycle. I love it. And what about any regrets? Mm, I think um, maybe maybe at certain times I probably yeah. Uh, so, so any regrets that I have was was that maybe earlier in yeah I guess two two around the same concept. So one I thought that just because I heard that uh, you know that there's there's this law that you know if you survive three years or five years or something you know you're 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 gonna make it forever in business uh, you're saying right yeah you're yeah. you've it's experienced success because you because those ninety three percent failed or something yeah. like that. I, you know, I, I heard that, that moment and what I tried to do, I also heard something about, you know, it took a certain amount of time to like really, um, get to a certain level with business. So what I tried to do was I tried to work hard and I tried to accelerate that curve so that I could get everything done instead of the three to five year window to find out if it worked, could I do it in one? Um, on one level, I kind of killed myself, you know, or, or I, I, Definitely put a little overworked um, on on one level, just because I was trying to beat a metric that you know who knows who made it up. Um, I'm sure there's uh, lots of research by, by, by behind it, but um, yeah. So I was kind of working against this invis- invisible metric, um, and then other parts I probably didn't sacrifice enough. So when I got you know, a certain level of success that I sort of at, at certain points in the his, in the history of the company, I've, um, enjoyed it. Um, and then just sort of, um, kind of lost my, uh, fire a little bit and, um, and kind of figured out like, well, I don't know, it caused me to lose some, some motivation. Cause then there was less of a goal because the initial goal was achieved. Make company cool, check the box you know, have it make, you know, positive and, and sustainable revenue, check the box. So then if I didn't have another goal already in mind, I lost the the sight of what, what, what should I be doing next? Yeah, um, you're preaching the choir here, man. Like, so you, you start this company, you work so hard to get it off the ground. Then you, then you start, then you work so hard to make money and get clients. And then you get that. And then you go, then you're like, Oh wait, what's next? Like we're, we're profitable. Like, your head is so you're so far head down for so long that you forget to look 10 yards ahead, yep. hundred yards ahead, right. Two years ahead. And then you, it is, it, it's some of those things where you say, what now, yep. you know, um, I've, I'm actually was just basically in this spot about six months ago, a year ago. And that's part of the reason the podcast figure out, you know, are we going to keep going in this direction or a different direction? And it was a little bit of just not looking far enough ahead, which is, which you feel so, kind of dumb a little bit. I mean, it's, it makes sense. Uh, and it's not like we weren't looking ahead. It just, um, I think that mo- it got, becomes demotivation when you didn't have such a strong goal to, to rally against. Mm-hmm. What about, um, has your life turned out how you thought it would? Um, yeah, I think, I think, um, in, in most cases, um, I, I didn't exactly predict where I'd be right now. But um, I think the uh, there, there it's been a pleasant surprise. So um, yeah, I've been able to build the uh, let's say you know two remote companies and and still be able to manage them uh, whether I'm traveling or not. Um, I have other people that you know uh, that can take on certain work if if I'm you know unavailable. Um, and so that that uh, ability to be kind of the digital nomad and travel a little bit and still keep everything working is, um, is a kind of an unexpected, pleasant surprise. And what was your favorite place to travel to? Um, re it, uh, recently it's, uh, I think, yeah, this past summer I was surprised that London was really, really nice. Um, I, I liked that I could experience all the, you know, a, a variety of different accents, 10 or, 10 or 12 different accents in one day. Um, and everyone spoke English. I didn't have to learn another language. Um, but I, I did spend, uh, about six months in Ukraine this past year, um, where I had to, you know, learn some Russian and, um, yeah, different, different culture there for sure. What's your favorite Russian uh, expression? 
Oh, um, can you give it to us in Russian no, or not? No, 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 no just no. butcher it. No, <laughs> I, I love it. Uh, <laughs> almost just lost my train of thought uh, there. Um, what did, what advice would you give your 15 year old self if you could, if you could? Um, yeah, I think, I think it would probably just be, um, just, you know, balanced, stay organized, stay focused. Um, you know, the, I think when, when things get out of balance, um, you know, you, you're, let's say you work a lot, your health can slip. And, uh, you know, if you're work, work out too much, then, you know, your finances can slip. Um, you, uh, work too much on your strategic planning, uh, your mental health, you know, you can wind up, uh, potentially sabotaging yourself and saying, Oh, I'll never get there. It's too challenging or too far ahead or something like that. So, um, I think that, um, yeah, the, my, my best advice would be, you know, try to map out somewhat of a, of, of a short, medium, long-term plan, and then, um, develop, spend time developing good habits while still moving forward in whatever direction you want. And last question, uh, how would you like to be remembered? I think, um, I definitely would like to be remembered for inventing something that, that helps humanity. But, um, as I develop this network builder app, um, I I'd like to, you know, be remembered by, you know, positively affecting culture change, um, introducing people in maybe such a specific way that, uh, that it's uh, notable. I love it. Well, Matt, thank you so much for being on the podcast. It was a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. Cheers.